For this fourth installment of our October Salvation Campaign, I'd like to paint on the chalkboards of your minds a sermon title entitled Saved by Grace Through Faith. Saved by Grace <clears throat> through, through Faith. I want to invite your intellect and summon your sermonic senses to Paul's profound epistle that he writes to the churches in Ephesus. Somebody shout Ephesus. As we dive into this sermon, I need you to know something about the Christians in Ephesus. Ephesus was a major capital city during this time. Ephesus was of Asia. Ephesus was located in Western Asia Minor at the mouth of the Castor River. It was a place geographically situated and located where there were major river valleys, which made this city an attractive city because ships and merchants and boats would be able to enter into Ephesus. Therefore, Ephesus was a major commercial city. It was a major political city, but it was also a major religious city. Ephesus boasted the worship of over 50 different gods. And when I say gods, I mean lower G gods, not the real uppercase G god. But they worshiped all of these idol gods and Ephesus was a place of harlotry. Ephesus was a place of sorcery. Ephesus was a center of homosexuality. Ephesus was a place where prostitutes were readily available. Uh, the alcohol, the liquor, and the wine was flowing. Uh, it was a place where it was like Vegas. What happens, come on somebody, in Vegas, don't act like you ain't been there, praise God, stays in Vegas. It doesn't mean that when you go to Vegas, you got to get into all that. I'm just give, using some human here. Uh, a little levity is good for the soul this morning. Amen. But I want you to understand that because if you don't understand the kind of churches that were in Ephesus, then you won't understand Paul's argument. Now, in order for Paul, who wrote six chapters, first three chapters primarily deal with Christian doctrine. Last three chapters, four, five and six primarily deal with Christian practice. Now, the reason why that's important for you to know for, before I dive into this presentation is because if you don't know that Paul's goal is to get these believers to start living the way Christ wanted them to live, then you, you won't understand they needed to know who they were first. Because if you don't know who you are, then you'll never live up to the expectations that God wants you to. That's why they needed to be told and taught what they had and who they were in Christ, therefore, then they could live out their lives in Christ the way God wanted, which means to the church of, of Newburgh today is that God is concerned with the way we live. But the way you live is predicated on you understanding who you are. So if you don't know who God says you are, then you won't know how God wants you to live. 
So in chapters one and two, he lets them know about all the spiritual blessings that they have in Christ. Now, this, this was worth coming to church today, because if you don't know what you have in Christ, then the devil can convince you because you don't have what you want to have and you don't have all the materials that everybody else seems to have. Maybe you're missing something. But I want you to know that blessings are beyond materialistic things. Blessings are beyond houses, cribs, clothes and cars. I wish I had somebody in here. Sometimes when you wake up in the morning, your crib, your car and your clothes can help you because you got some thoughts in your mind a car can't help with. You got some thoughts in your mind uh, that a house can't help with. You got some thoughts in your mind that none of that materialistic stuff can help with. But how many of you know you so glad you got God in your life? Because when I'm dealing with stuff in my life, I need God to direct me. I need God to order my steps. I need God to guide me in my life. And what you're going to need is an understanding of who God is and who you are in Christ so that you will know how to handle life and know how to live and live up to your calling and your purpose. So by the time you and I rendezvous in the chapter number two of the book of Ephesus, here's what you'll find. You'll find in verse one, let's go ahead and dive into it today. I want you to stay with me in the Bible because I got to teach you some things in the Bible because I'm telling you that the biggest trick of the enemy is to try to convince you and I that we are not who God says we are. And, and the first thing you got to understand is what you got in Christ. Let me say it one more time. Uh, the first thing you got to understand as a child of God is what you have in Christ. Now, what you have in Christ uh, sh will not change based on where you are geographically situated and located. Because just because you are living in a world full of foolishness, debauchery, sorcery, homosexuality, and wickedness doesn't mean that the culture should dictate what the church believes. The church, come on somebody, should dictate what the culture believes. It should not be the other way around. So this is important because when you know what you have in Christ, it ought to make you act different. When you know that you are saved, thought I had a church today. When you know the information that will bless you despite what you go through, that I am saved. And the fact that I know I am saved gives me some kind of courage and confidence and conviction to live my life in this crazy, corrupt, wicked world despite the challenges that I go through because I know that one day when my Savior appears and when my Savior returns, he is going to take me to a place where I don't have to worry no more about this corruption. Come on, somebody. I don't have to worry about all this stuff in this culture. Do I have anybody that wants to be in that place one day that doesn't have to worry about trying to make a dollar and trying to get here to there and robbing Peter to pay one day you ain't gonna have to have no worries because you are saved in Christ so what the devil does not want you to understand is the power of being saved in Christ but he, he, here's the problem here's the problem there's a lot of folk that do not understand the power of being saved in Christ. And because we don't understand, then we don't we can't draw any encouragement because we don't understand. We can't draw any confidence because we don't understand. We are not convicted and committed to do what God wants us to do because we don't have a good understanding about our salvation. So what Paul does is Paul knew that. So what Paul wanted to do was solidify the Ephesian church's understanding about who they were in Christ and what they had and what their state and status was. So that they can go out into this corrupt, crooked world and still live like God wanted them to. Okay, now you're ready for verse one. So the Bible says in verse number one, hey, listen to the powerful pen of the Apostle Paul. He says in verse number one, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Can I pause right there, Brother Dorsey? I need you to know that you need to realize that Paul is telling this church that at one point in their lives, 
they were dead. I need you to know what they were dead in. They were dead in their trespasses and sins. Now, the word dead comes from the Greek term necros, and it literally means to be dead, deceased, destitute, uh, departed, and destitute of life. Not only destitute of life, being literally inactive, inoperable. So these Christians at one point were dead. In other words, they were away from the source of light and life. You know what dead means. It ceases to exist. It has no hope. It is unable to move. It is unable to be animate. And I want you to understand that these Christians at one point were dead in their trespasses. Trespasses is when uh, you either intentionally or uh, mistakenly do something that's outside of God's moral bounds. Anybody ever made a mistake before? Anybody didn't intend to do it? Okay, let me come to this side. Anybody intended to do it? This is this the real side over here if y'all want to admit to that? Yeah, bro, Joe, I meant to cuss them. Praise God. Uh, you know, I know God will forgive me, but we, we all know that at one point you are dead in your trespasses and your what? And your sins. Now, I need you to know that sins is when you, you and I miss the mark. It is, it is when God has uh, set up for us a way to hit a bullseye morally, but we end up going to the left going to the right, not doing what God wants us to do, so we miss the mark. How many of you know you've missed the mark a time or two? And, 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 I, and I'm being generous when I say a time or two. I could say 200 times 400 in one day. Praise God. And, and I want you to know that there is a... Okay, let me... I want to dive into this thing, but I, I need to tell you some things. What's different today, Brother Sanders, is the mindset of people. We used to, 30 years ago, folks used to come to church and feel guilty about sin. Now folk come to church and flaunt it. And something is wrong with a mind that says that I don't feel guilty about sin. Something is wrong with a person's mind who intentionally does sin and feels nothing. You are in a dangerous place away from God and potentially getting ready to lose your soul. We need some people who have such a God consciousness where you feel bad about the wrong that you do because you have a consciousness of God in your life that the same God that has given you life can cut off your ass supply. The same God that gave you life can stop you from be living with him in eternity. The same God that can bless you can put place a curse on you. Am I talking to anybody that still has a fear of God in this house? So never fall in love with sin because sin is what set death in motion. When Adam and Eve ate off the tree that God said, you shall not eat off of it for the day you eat off it, you will surely do up. And so sin set forth death in the world. So I need you to never fall comfortable with sin. Always feel bad when you sin. Because when you feel bad, that's the kind of sorrow that God wants you to have. Because the right kind of sorrow will lead to a repentance. Somebody shout repentance. But you will never repent if you never feel sorry. You understand what I'm saying? So they were dead and were what? There's trespasses and their sins. The Bible says in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience among them. Watch this. Paul says y'all were dead and y'all were walking uh, in the wrong path according to the course of this world. And Paul said myself and the other disciples and apostles did the same thing. Notice verse 3 when Paul includes him and the apostles. He says, among them, we too. Paul includes himself and the rest of the disciples. We too all formerly live. Watch this. Remember, remember living in the lust of your flesh? <clears throat> indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature children of wrath. Even the rest. But I need a shout on this. But God, I'm getting ready to say. 
I said, I need a shout in this house on this, but God, I'm getting ready to say, even though you were children of wrath, just as the red, but God. Oh, I said, but God. Now, now, now watch this. That means that, that this God is getting ready to do something for these Ephesian people and Paul and those who are with them that they did not warrant and that they did not merit and they did not deserve. But God, the Bible said being rich in mercy. Somebody shout mercy. I, I want you to know that God is wealthy in the area that you and I need. Y'all ready for it? It is the area of mercy. Mercy, the Bible says, but God being rich in mercy. Watch this. God was wealthy in an area in terms of his divine attributes that you and I needed God to be wealthy in. I'm glad God was not poor in mercy because if God was poor in mercy, he may have not sent Jesus. But aren't you glad that God is rich in mercy? Aren't you glad that God is rich in the area that we need mercy? The Bible says God being rich in mercy. Why, Brother Jones? Because of his great love toward us. Watch this, which he loved us. So I want you to know that mercy is kindness, <clears throat> goodwill, compassion for those miserable and afflicted with so when god is rich in mercy he is rich in giving people who are undeserving kindness come on somebody goodwill and compassion for those who are in a miserable predicament and when you are dead in your sins you are in a miserable predicament anybody knew that when you looked in the mirror after you committed a sin sometimes you can even recognize that person in the mirror you were taught better you knew better but the flesh just got the best of you i need some honest witnesses in this house on today and sometimes you knew you could have done better but you were allowed your flesh to lead your mind you allowed your flesh uh, to dictate and determine your decisions you allowed your flesh to determine your actions and you knew you were wrong and you knew you didn't deserve anything but thank god for being rich in mercy i wish i had somebody thank god for his kindness thank god for his compassion thank god for his mercy it is a mercy is a special and immediate regard to eliminate a person's misery. Aren't you glad? Let's have a seven second praise break right now for the mercy of God. I'm so glad that God was merciful on my life because I didn't deserve nothing but hell, death, and a grave. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Watch this. Watch this. Notice what he did. Well, notice what he did, church. The Bible says, even when we were dead in our tra transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Now, here's what God did. While you and I were dead in sin, somebody shout dead in sin. Now, let me give you five seconds to process the fact so that you don't uh, think about nobody else but you in this moment. You. And I were dead in sin. You can't appreciate that until you realize that. Because I know how we do. We think of ourselves as being such these good people. And, and some of us do some really good deeds. But remember this, your good deeds do not take away from the fact that you've done some evil deeds. So your good don't eradicate your evil. Some of us think like that. OK, well, I'll just sin 20 times a day and then wait till I get to church on Sunday and give two hundred dollars. Now, here's what God going to do. He's going to take your two hundred dollars and bless the church. But they ain't got nothing to do. Come on, somebody with all that evil you've done uh, throughout the course of your week. Say amen if you can in this house. So just know sin is a big deal now. Um, the Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. Now, here, here's where the rubber meets the road. He made us alive together. And the reason how he made us alive together is because he made us alive together with Christ. 
So the only way to rise, hear this, the only way to rise from sinful deadness is to be made alive with Christ. Y'all got that? The only way to rise from spiritual deadness is to be made alive together with Christ. Now, you can't appreciate being made alive until you realize what you were dead in. You cannot appreciate being made alive until you realize what you were dead in. And if you realize you were dead in sin, now you know the importance of being made alive together with Christ. Now watch this. He says, after he says we've been made alive, anybody glad about being made alive together with Christ? Anybody know you living spiritually now when you were spiritually dead? You were physically alive, but spiritually dead. Now you're physically alive and spiritually alive as well. Let's give God some glory for being physically and spiritually. I'm alive. Lean on your name and shout, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. And we don't mean being physically alive. We know you physically alive, but now we know that you're spiritually alive. Well, how did you become made alive? Because you got together with Christ. And now you've been made alive spiritually. Then he says something that many people miss. It, it, it takes time to get this, Brother Richardson. It's very difficult for some people to understand this, this, this beautiful spiritual genre of the doctrine of grace. Somebody shout grace. Now, what I want you to do is just open your mind to this concept. I'll spend the rest of my time here, and I hope and pray that you're able to really praise God at the end of this sermon because you have now really gotten a good understanding of the doctrine of grace and that you appreciate it from a spiritual standpoint. And notice what he says. He says, you, you have been, notice verse number five, <clears throat> made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated him in the heavenly places in Christ so that in the ages to come, he might show his surpassing riches of his what? of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ, verse number eight, for by grace you have been what? Through what? And what else? And that not of yourselves, it is what? So I want you to say this with me. Saved by grace through faith. Okay, now, now y'all all over the place. So, you know, I'm, I'm an organizer, so let's do it on three. <laughs> Y'all ready? One, two, three. Saved by again. Louder. Last time. Saved by grace through faith. For you note takers, here's what I'd like for you to write down. Saved. Right? When you say saved, that is the conclusion. So I want you to write down conclusion. All right. By grace. By grace is the connection. Through faith is the condition. If you can't shout to this at the end of this thing, I don't know what's going to make you shout. And that's going to make you shout with pain if you can't shout to this. Saved is the conclusion. That's what we're trying to get to. But the only way you get there is you have to be connected to that salvation through grace. But you won't be connected to that salvation through grace unless you understand the condition, which is by faith. So when we say, Sister Nelson, we're saved by grace through faith, it, it, it literally means that the condition for you to end up with salvation is you have to have faith. And if you have faith in your ability for God to save you through Jesus, then God will do it through the connection of his grace. And you will reach the conclusion of knowing that I am saved on the basis of my faith through grace. Now that doesn't have anything to do with your works. All right, let me just tell you, this stuff is so good. Half of y'all probably thinking, 
this too good to be true. And guess what? You right. But it is true. That means that we are saved through our faith. And God gives us the grace that we need to keep us saved so we don't feel the need to work to be saved because Jesus already did all the work to save us when he died on the cross. If that means if Jesus has done all the work, all I got to do is have faith in the finished work of Jesus and God says my state and my status is saved. Now, now, this is why the good news, Brother Maribos, is so good. The good news is, is I don't have to work. So that means every good deed you do, God gives you credit for that, but he doesn't place that in the salvation bucket. That means your good is just good. But you don't want your good to have to stand before you. Because if your good has to stand before you, that also simultaneously means that your bad got to. So if, if, if I'm saved based on my good and my bad, it's always going to be a juxtaposition because some days I'm good. So my salvation is in the finished work of Jesus. That means if Christ came back right now, let me tell you what Christ is looking for. If Christ appeared in the clouds right now, let me tell you what he's looking for. He's looking for folk who have obeyed the gospel to believe that God will come back and save us on the basis of what Jesus did, not on the basis of what we've done. Woo! I'm saved by his grace. Well, Brother Joe, what happens when I get baptized and I make a mistake? You better give God glory for his grace. Because all of us are going to make mistakes. So you got to get in your mind. Your salvation cannot be predicated on your perfection. It is predicated on perfection, but it's predicated on perfection that's not yours. It's predicated on Jesus' perfection because he was perfect. And what God will do is God will bless you on the basis of his perfection and not yours. So you're going to always be saved if you have faith in Jesus saving you. So when he says, Ephesian church, yeah, you live around sorcery. Yeah, you live around harlotry. Yeah, you live around idolatry. Yeah, you live in a city that worship all these different gods and folks are going crazy and homosexuality is rampant and men are loving men and women are loving women and people are changing their sex and ignoring how God made them. Yeah, you're living in a crazy, corrupt, crooked world, but you got to have faith to know that he saved you in the midst. Come on, somebody of this crazy and crooked and corrupt world. And he wants your life to be an example of how people need to live. Because if this world has no examples of how to live, that if, if this world needs examples of how to live, that's got to come through the church. So he says, in order for you to live in chapters four, five, and six, the way God wants you to, number one, you got to be sat satisfied in your knowledge of the fact that you are saved. And many people's salvation fluctuate back and forth based on if they have a good day or a bad day. And God never wanted to be that way. So for those of you who think just because you got baptized and you're so good uh, and, and because you do everything right and you cross every T and you dot every I, you ain't going to make it to glory on the basis of your goodness. You're going to make it to, to, to glory on the basis of some goodness, but it ain't going to be, be yours. <laughs> Anybody know it's going to be based on the goodness of God? Oh, my goodness. So let me tell you how, how good the gospel is. God wanted men and women, boys and girls, Jews and Gentiles to be in one spiritual body. And he allows us to be made alive with Christ together. Once we identify the fact that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And he does that through Christ. 
and it is not of you yourselves. So when the text says in verse number eight, let's look at verse number eight one more time. I'm going to give you a couple things and I'm going. Verse number eight says, for by grace you have been what? Uh, through what? And that not of your what? So you ain't did nothing your So if the text says it is not of yourself, why you keep thinking you got to do something to be saved? So once you believe and obey, you get into covenant with God through Jesus and the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all of your past sins. Get this. Your present sins, I can't hear nothing, and your future sins. Can we give God some glory that the blood is proactive and retroactive? So Jesus, Brother Furman, saves us on the basis of what he did on the cross, not on the basis of what we did in our mess. So what you and I have to do is realize that the text says a saved conclusion uh, by grace, which is the connection through faith, which is the condition. So you'll be saved if you understand the condition is to have faith. So your faith is when you believe in what you cannot see, but being fully convinced that it's true and it's going to happen on the basis of who told me something. Now, when God tell you something, you can believe it without seeing it because you know that the person who told you that is credible. Now, we don't believe everything that everybody say because everybody ain't credible. But when the God who created the universe the moon and the stars. I wish I had some somebody with me today. And all the bodies of water and these human bodies and the blood vessels and the heart and the brain and the liver and the lungs and the kidneys and the eyes and the nose and the ears and the digestive tract. And he created everything for us to live. Now, if he created everything for us to be able to live through this human body, well, you know he has created everything for us to live in eternity in this spiritual body called the church. I wish I had somebody. And what God wants you to know is he's designed everything for you to live, but it happens, salvation happens through faith. So what does that mean for me, Brother Jones? I'm glad you asked. What that means for you is you got to stop depending on your pseudo perfection to stay saved. Stop it. You're ruining your life. You're ruining your mind. You're making Christianity not what God wanted it to be. God wanted you to know that the salvation that we have through faith by grace through faith, is a gift of God. Now, when a person purchases a gift for you, then that means that they have thought about what they can do that would honor you, to bless you, to please you. And what they do is they reach in their wallet. They reach in their purse. And they go and they buy something and they don't they don't care what the price is. They buy it because they want to give it to you so that you didn't do nothing to deserve it. They gave it to you as a gift. And aren't you glad that God gave us Jesus as a free gift to sustain our life on earth and in heaven? And because it's free, we didn't do anything to earn it. Because it's free, we didn't do anything to deserve it. Now, what will put some running in your feet and some shouting in your mouth and some lifting up of your holy hands is to know that I'm going to make it to heaven being imperfect. I'm going to make it to heaven because I have faith in Jesus' perfection. Because until, until you know what God looking at, you can be stuck in your salvation. See, here's what God is looking at. Let me get three brothers real quick. Come here. Let me get three quickly. Three brothers. Come on, y'all two. Come here. Give me one more. Come on, come on, come on. 
All right, y'all clap for these young men coming here. Now, now one of y'all want to be going to be God from who going to be God? They're like, nah, they said that brother Jones, that's idolatry. I don't want to. <laughs> Good to see you, brother Thompson. Demetri, you're going to be God since you're the tallest. I mean, you're just going to be God in this illustration. You're going back to Demetri in about five minutes. All right. Is that all right? <clears throat> now, Demetri is God in this situation. And I got to get you to see this because if you don't see this, then you're going to place your salvation in what you do instead of what Jesus did. So when God looks at us, watch this. When God looks at us, this um, Brother Eubank is going to be us. This is, now Brother Eubank, I'm, I got to say some things here. You okay with that, right? Now this is, this is the us that, um, I just don't want y'all looking at Brother Eubank funny. Because this is really you. Now this is the us that, we come to church a little bit, you know what I'm saying? But we, you know, we like to turn up a little bit too. We still doing some stuff that God ain't pleased with. I said, this is us right here. And every now and then we, we, we have the wrong mindset, wrong facial expression, and we may say a bad word every now and then. And this is the, the us that struggle. We want to go to heaven, but we, we keep seeing that we keep doing wrong stuff. And the wrong stuff that we do make us feel like something was wrong with our salvation. Anybody ever thought that before? Like something, maybe something wrong with the way I'm saved. Maybe I ain't saved right because I struggle with my flesh. So this is us that's in and out sometimes and we struggle. We want to do right, but we just we just can't get it right. And, and Brother Tom, you're going to be Jesus just for a moment. So when God see us, you won't. Let's just go over here a little bit more. Put him in the middle right here. Let's just walk over here. So when God sees us. God looks at us through Jesus. Now, Jesus never committed a sin, never committed a crime. Jesus came on earth to die for us. Come on, somebody. Uh, Jesus loves us. And when God sees Jesus, he sees perfection. We see his splendor. We see his majesty. He's 100% God and 100% man. He's a man God, a God man, but he came to be like us so he can die for us. So when God sees us, he sees us through our faith in who? So what we got to do is have faith in. So when God sees us, he sees us through. And God is going to take us to heaven through Let's give God some praise for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 2,000 years ago, he came. Thank you, Jesus. So our, our struggle is we think that God is going to look at us on the basis of how well we live and how well we perform. So if I did 10 good things today, but did one wrong thing, I think I'm going to make it because my good outweighed my bad. And that's the wrong way to look at salvation. You do good because it's just good to do good. But you don't do good expecting God to reward you on the basis of your goodness because you ain't going to always, anybody know you ain't going to always be good. And my, and, but, but thank God my good days are with my bad days, but your, but your good days won't stand for you. What's going to stand for you is the blood of Jesus. So when God, the Father, sees you having faith in Jesus, God says, come on in. And you go over there with God, and you go over there, you go over there with God, and you go over there with Jesus. Praise God. All right? Now, you can get to God because of your relationship with Jesus. Now, come back over, brother, you back. Now, if you ever put your faith in your own perfection, well, here's what God is going to do. Step back for a minute, Jesus. Step back a little bit. There you go. So when, so if you put your faith in your perfection to save you, God is going to look at you and say, yeah, I see you did a couple good things, but you got sin in your life. I see you lusting. Don't you get quiet over here, y'all. I see you told your boss a lie when you came to work about why you were late. And you said it with a straight face and, and had the audacity to use your Christianity to think that your manager would believe you based on the fact that you're a Christian. 
How many of you look somebody dead in their face and lied? So God sees you for who you are. God sees us for your hidden sins. The stuff that you said in your mind about people and the stuff that you've done before. And so God sees, not as man sees, but God looks at the heart. I wish I had some Bible readers in here. So when God sees you, he's going to sit depart from me. Ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Because you're, pen, you're depending in your own righteousness to save you. Or maybe you don't even have a relationship with it all. And you just say, well, uh, I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. And God is going to look at you and say, uh-uh, no, you ain't. This is us, y'all. So here's what you want. When the day of salvation comes, you want Jesus in your life. I said you want Jesus in your life. And you want, you want to have so much faith in Jesus. Where you say, God, I'm a sinner. I struggle every day. Lord, I try, I try, I try, but I always fall short. So, God, I'm having faith in you, in Jesus Christ to save me. And what I believe is going to save me is my faith in Jesus, because God, Jesus was perfect. Jesus never committed a sin. So I need the grace to save me. I need I wish I had somebody in here. I need the grace of God to save me. I don't want you to look at all of my bad, all of my good. I want you to look at my faith in Jesus. Now, when he looks at us through Jesus, we look good. Step away, Jesus. But now how do we look? Ain't nobody going to heaven. If God look at us for who we really are. That's why you have to have faith in. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Now, y'all walk together to God. Let's give God some praise that I'm rolling with God. I'm rolling with Jesus. And God is going to accept us on the basis of our faith in Jesus. Thank you, brothers. Thank you so much. All right. Let me, let me give you a few things to know. And I'm going to give you an invitation to be saved in just a moment. I don't know who's here. It's not really my business. I'm just glad that you're here and that you found value in this church. But let me give you a few things to understand that are negative, but can be a positive about your salvation. Salvation is a deliverance from a relationship where you serve sin and you are delivered to a relationship where you serve righteousness. So anytime we say we need to be saved, that means there's some danger somewhere. So if you are, if you need to be saved, that means you've done something to place yourself in the position of danger. Are y'all with me today? If you need to be saved, that means you've done something to place yourself in the position of danger. Let me give you five things that the text teaches us in chapter two that's going to bless you and we'll close today. Number one, these Ephesian believers were separate, separated from Christ. These Ephesians were separated from Christ. Number two, they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. This is before Jesus. Number three, they were strangers from the covenants of promise. They had no covenant with God that God would promise them eternal salvation. Number four, they had no hope in the world. Could you imagine living in the world with no hope in the world? Hope is an expectation, an anticipation that something good is going to happen. Could you imagine living in this world with no hope? The Ephesians had no hope in the world. Number five, they were without God in the world. Do you know how many people die every day without God in the world, without hope in the world? Strangers to God's covenant of promise excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and they are separated from God. And watch this. You got to understand that because when you are separate from Christ, you have no relationship with Jesus that connects you to God. Now, this is very important. So let me tell you this. God wants you to experience salvation 
by grace through faith. Can we say amen to that today? What does God want me to do? God wants me to experience salvation by grace through faith. That means I'm not trusting on my perfection to save me. I'm trusting in Jesus' perfection to save me. That, that doesn't mean that. Let me just tell you this, because this is why people don't teach this, because they're so concerned with people running amok. But nobody who is really close with Jesus is going to go out there and do nothing crazy if you know what God has done to get you out of your debt of sin. Let me see if I can make it plain this way. If you had $100,000 in credit card debt and somebody came and paid it off for you, you would look like a fool to run it back up the next day. Because it says that you're not appreciative of the person who came into your life to take care of your debt. But aren't you glad that Jesus, come on somebody, woo, came into your life to take care of your debt of sin. So if Jesus comes into your life to take away your debt of sin, you're going to go back out there the next day and do all these different sins because it shows that you don't appreciate what God has done by sending Jesus in your life. So you spend the rest of your life showing God appreciation for the grace that's been extended to you. Okay, so, so to, that, to that end, um, your salvation isn't because of anything of yourself. Now, let me say this because this is why people get scared and don't want to teach this because they don't understand grace. But grace doesn't mean it's a free pass to sin. Grace means that I'm not going to make it because I've been so good, but because I haven't been so good, God did not allow that to stop his love from being shed in my life. I wish I had somebody. So that literally means that you're going to be saved with your mistakes. <laughs> Woo! I said you're going to be saved with your errors. With your mistakes. And God knows it, but he's going to use Jesus' blood to keep you cleansed. So that means when you get to heaven, it'll be because of his grace. His, his unmerited, your, your, the favor that you receive that you did not earn or deserve. Now, if you, if you don't get that, you can't get salvation by grace through faith. So you got to believe it, though you may not understand it fully. You got to know you're going to make it because of grace. That's why the songwriter said, amazing how sweet the sound. Here's your testimony that saved. Let's give him some glory. Let's give him some glory because we're saved by grace. This does not give you a free pass to sin because a free pass. Listen, for you to go out there and sin tells God that you don't understand what you just did. And you don't appreciate the salvation that is now being given to you and extended to you. So when you appreciate something, you do everything you can to show the person you appreciate it. Now, what we did was well, when you and I, well, when me and my wife were blessed by you a few weeks ago, we tried to give as many people thanks as we could. And we told you, thank you. We gave you cards. Why? Because we wanted to show you appreciation for what you did for us that we did not earn or deserve. Amen, somebody. And so when God bless your life, you don't want to go back out there and disrespect God. You want to show some appreciation based on your moral behavior that God, I'm going to act differently. I'm going to speak differently. I'm going to hang with the right people because I want to show you appreciation for my salvation. So, Brother Jew, you spend the rest of your life thanking God through your moral behavior. You don't go back out there and do stuff that you know God doesn't approve of. So, so grace is not a free pass to sin. It's, it's, it's a free pass to give God glory through your behavior. Amen, somebody. Now, let me give you... A couple things real quick, real quick. Somebody just shot real quick. You need to know this, right? So you need, you need to know what it means to be saved by grace through faith. You know what that means. Number one, so let me help you today. Because because here's what people do. People sometimes either get baptized. Let's just be honest. Let's, can we be honest today? 
I said, can we be honest today? Who want me to be honest today? Some of y'all just say, okay, I don't care what you do. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to be honest every day. Praise God. Now, now some of y'all need this. So two things happen. Number one, when you get baptized, if you don't understand grace, then the moment you do something wrong, you could allow the devil to make you think that what you did wrong invalidates your baptism. And that is not true. Just know when you do something wrong, you're human. It does not mean you feel you, you should always feel bad about it. But just know when you do something wrong, it does not stop God from loving you. What will stop God from from blessing you with salvation is if you take your faith out of Jesus. Then you lost because the only thing, according to Hebrews 10, that can save you is Jesus. Now, watch this. So. When people get baptized, they say, oh, man, I'm, something must have been wrong because this thing didn't work right. Maybe I went down there long enough. The baptizer only had me down there for three seconds. Maybe he need to almost drown me. No. <laughs> Some folk need to be down there a little bit longer, praise God. But we don't want to drown nobody, praise God. I'm just, I'm just teasing you. Now, 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 now. Had nothing to do about with how long you were down there. You just need to know that God's expectation is not perfection. It is faithfulness. Somebody shout faithfulness. Are y'all getting this? God's expectation for you is not perfection. It's being faithful. So just know, let me give you a few things and I'm going. Here it is. Number one, I don't receive. Here's what happens when you get saved. Somebody shout saved. Let me tell you what happens when you get saved by grace through faith. Number one. I don't receive the punishment I deserve. Ain't nobody shouting at that in this house. Y'all, listen, y'all should be flipping over the pews right now. Let me come over here. I told you it takes some people a long time to get this. Listen, when you're saved by grace through faith, you don't receive the punishment you deserve. And know for all them sins you did. You know you deserve some punishment, but thank God for the good news that I don't get what I deserve. Let's give God some praise if you know I don't get what I deserve. That's grace. That's what makes his grace amazing. Number two, I got to hasten. Uh, I don't have to work to earn my salvation. You got to work to appreciate your salvation, not to earn it. Somebody shall appreciate it, appreciate it. I needed three hours for this one, but uh, number three, I don't have to live perfect. When you say by grace, it, it, it says say by grace through faith. It didn't say say by your perfection. So you have to have faith in his perfection, not yours, because otherwise you'll be beating yourself down every day. You have a bad thought. You do something wrong, say something wrong, think something wrong. And then you say, well, man, this salvation thing don't work. No, your understanding ain't working. You don't even know. You need to be shouting every time you do something wrong and God forgive you because you're saved by grace through faith and not that of ourselves. So you don't have to live perfect, but you do have to live faithful. Number four, I don't have to think I can live perfect. Because the reason why people believe they have to live perfect is because they think they have to live perfect. So you don't ever have to think that I got to live perfect because you can't do that anyway. Are y'all appreciating this today? Number five. This is what happens when you, when you believe you're saved by grace through faith. I have to have faith in Jesus who is perfect, who died for my sins. See, what you got to do if you're saved by grace through faith is have faith in Jesus who was, how many of you know I got, I got faith in Jesus and his perfection, not my own. Now listen, you can't go out here and live right if you don't know who you are. And if you don't know who, what you have, you can't appreciate Christianity to know that no matter, that matter what happens in this world, I'm saved by grace through faith. Let's say it together. 
I'm saved by grace. Even if I go through some trouble in my life, I'm if my friends turn their back on me, I'm if I never get a mansion on earth, I'm if, if my marriage is on the rocks and my kids ain't doing right, I'm still parents. Y'all should have gave God some glory right there. Amen. Somebody you save by grace through your what? Through your all right. Number six, I have to have faith that Jesus' perfection will count towards my salvation. So when you lay on that operating table and when you get 100 years old or 90 years old and they say they call in the hospice in, when you laying your head on that pillow and you're thinking about, man, listen, I'm getting ready to transition. You know what you got to think about? That my faith is in Jesus' perfection to save me. I don't have to look back and see if I didn't do this and I didn't do that. No, I done made it this far through faith and I'm trusting Jesus' perfection in my life and I'm keeping my faith in Jesus, Father. And the Father is going to look at you and say, come on in because you kept your faith in Jesus' perfection. Last one. And we, we're getting ready to give you an invitation to come. Number seven, I have to believe that I'll be saved because of the finished work Jesus accomplished on my behalf when he shed his blood on the cross. This thing is all about faith. And when God look at us, he wants us to have faith in what Jesus did and what Jesus' blood does for sinners like you and me. So if you're here today, I'm done. I've tried to, to help you best I could with the time that I had. And uh, if I was in Africa, I'd preach for four hours a day, I promise you. Because Africans, they if you go an hour, they say, that's too short. Yep. See, they ain't got nowhere else to go. <clears throat> Nothing else to do. Ain't no Facebook, ain't no YouTube. They don't care what condition the church building in. They say, we want some more word. You know why? Because all they got is the word. And when the word is all you got, you got everything you need. Anybody believe that on the day? If, I, if all I got is the word, I got everything I need. Now watch this, but I, I know I ain't in Africa. I'm in Louisville. So I got to close this thing. All right, so I want you to know you can trust the blood of Jesus. Listen to me. I want you to know if you want to be saved, because, yeah, we can talk about how to get money and we can talk about how to live this great life. And we do talk about that. And those things are important for your family and for your future. But the only thing that's going to matter in your life is did I know Jesus and did Jesus know me now? I want you to, I'm going to get out the way for you to come and I want to preach you to a decision today. Now, if you're here today and you've been holding on to this salvation that you just believe, but really was not biblical and maybe you were thought you were saved when you were younger, maybe you thought you were saved when you're older, but you never really walk with Jesus. Today is your day to say, you know what? I'm going to spend the rest of my life walking with Jesus. For the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works so that we would walk in them. So if God wants to use you for good works, you got to get saved for real, for real. I said get saved for real, for real. And we want you to get 10 toes in the church. Some people come to church, but not a part of the life of the church. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what we're doing. You're not a part of the vision. Stop that today. Repent of your sins, because this whole life is about you being a Christian, being actively involved and doing what God wants you to do to help us at this church. Take more territory for King Jesus. Anybody with us today to take more territory?
for King Jesus. Show it by your actions. And we can do so much with committed minded people, spiritual minded people. So if you want to be a part of this movement, you got to get in Christ. So if you hadn't got in Christ, come on, come on, come on. Today is your day. We want to baptize you right now. The water is ready. All you got to do is make up your mind to say yes to Jesus. And all you got to do with this church is walk down right here. When you say, Brother Jones, well, I don't know what's going to happen. Listen, all you got to do is believe with all of your heart that Jesus died. He was buried. He was risen from the dead. If you believe that, somebody shall believe that. One more time. Believe that. I need you to believe that with all of your heart. All of your heart. And I want you to have faith that you're going to repent of your sins. Confess Jesus. And be baptized. Somebody shout baptized. Now the only way you get saved. Is if you believe in his death. His burial. His resurrection. You repent of your sins. Confess Christ to be the son of God. And you got to be baptized. Because Acts 22 16 says. Why do you tarry? Why do you delay? Get up. And be baptized. Let's put that up there. Get up and be baptized. Watch this. And wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And when you do that, you are being saved by grace. You're, you're trusting in Jesus to save you. If you need to do that today and be baptized, we'll baptize you in the middle of this service. Stand to your feet. If you want to be saved and you know you're lost, and you need Jesus, and you know you don't have to be perfect because he was, come down and give your life right now. Walk down and give your life right now. Come on. 